Good morning. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church. I'm delighted to see you all here today. Equally delighted to have you joining us online this morning. Uh, we are particularly grateful for the presence of visitors in both places. Uh, we hope that you find this time of worship together to be meaningful. It's a special day in the life of First Presbyterian Church. Not only is it Presbyterian Heritage Sunday, the annual Sunday where we give a nod to where we came from, uh, but it is also a homecoming Sunday where we uh, circle back around and do some of the things we missed out on during pandemic times, like rededicating our uh, windows, the south window and the west transit window, which we'll do as part of our service today. Uh, following the service today, you are all invited down to Watchhorn Hall, where you'll each get approximately seven pieces of fried chicken. No, I'm just kidding. But we could use your appetite and would love your presence in Watchhorn Hall immediately following worship today uh, for a covered dish lunch. But there is plenty of food. Uh, if you uh, did not have a chance to bring a covered dish today, please don't let that hold you back. Uh, come on down there and join us for that time of fellowship together. Now I'd like to ask Blaine to come forward with a moment about the deacons, but before I do, I need to tell you, Blaine, about our very newest church member. She was born at 1022 this morning. Her name is Nora Frances Burden, and we are delighted that Edward and Katie have had a very healthy baby girl that uh, Katie brought into the world this very morning. So we rejoice uh, in that addition. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, good morning from the deacons. The deacons have some upcoming events that we would like you to be aware of. Now, gentlemen, be sure that you are in the worship service on Sunday, June the 19th, as we will have a gift for each of you for Father's Day. On July 17th, we will host our annual back-to-school lunch in Watchhorn Hall and collect supplies for Urban Mission to give to students as they prepare to go back to school in the fall. At the end of August, we will have an out and about trip to an Oklahoma City Dodgers baseball game. Deacons are covering the cost of the tickets and there will be a buffet and a hat included in the price of that ticket. More information will be forthcoming about signing up for that event. Now in two weeks on June the 5th, we will once again be doing Eucharistic visits to our shut-in and others who are not able to attend church. We will go out in groups of two or three to serve communion and have a short visit with these members and remind them that we honor the service that they have provided to this congregation over the years. Finally, thank you for your generous support of the deacons. In order to carry out all of the activities that we do each year, it is through your giving that we are able to care for you, the members of the congregation. Thank you, Blaine. The joy of today um, is tempered with sorrow. It is my sad duty uh, to announce that the sympathy of the congregation is extended to Becky and Wayne Osmond and Leslie and Mark Officer upon the death of Sierra Custer. Sierra was Leslie and Mark's daughter and the granddaughter of Becky and Wayne. Uh, she was tragically killed Thursday in a, a traffic accident when someone uh, ran a stop sign. So please get, keep uh, Becky and Wayne and the families involved in your prayers during this time of loss. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds to worship God.
Please rise now in body or spirit, however you're comfortable, and join me in the call to worship. The God of heaven has made a home on earth. The highest in all creation lives among the least. Come now, all who thirst. Come now, all who hunger. Come now, all who seek. Let us worship God. Please join me now in the prayer of the day. Loving God, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we gather to honor our roots and ask your blessing upon our families. As part of the larger family of God, we are given to honor you with our kith and kin, our heritage in our memories, and our assurance of your blessings for the future. Make us heirs of peace. Kindle in us the fire of your love. Sow in us respect for you. Strengthen our weakness by your power and bind us close to you and to each other. In Christ's name, amen. While we are sinners, Christ died for us. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Trusting in God's faithfulness and compassion, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Jesus, forgive my sins. Forgive the sins that I can remember and also the sins that I have forgotten. 
Forgive the wrong actions I have committed and the right actions I have omitted. Forgive the times I have been weak in the face of temptation and those when I have been stubborn in the face of correction. Forgive the times I have been proud of my own achievements and those when I have failed to boast of your works. Forgive the lies I have told to others and the truths I have avoided. Forgive me the pain I have caused others and the indulgence I have shown myself. Jesus, have pity on me and make me whole. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that, free from sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. I declare to you, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. To this peace we are called as members of a single body. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Young disciples come forward for discovery time. All right. Good morning, everyone. So last time I gave a children's sermon was two weeks ago, and it was Mother's Day, and it was brought to my attention that I may have alienated some of the fathers by saying something along the lines of, like, dads don't really matter today, it's all about moms, something to that effect. Um, So to be more inclusive today, we're going to open it up to all parents. We're going to talk about parents today. Parents love when you say to them, I love you. I'm not a parent, but as a child of two parents, I'm pretty sure this is true. When you tell your parents you love them, they love to hear that. But there's something they love even slightly more than telling them you love them. It's showing them you love them, right? Showing them in your actions that you love them. They love that just like a tiny bit more. What are some ways that we can show parents that we love them? Ian. Play card games with grandmas, parents, exactly. What's another way? Oh, you didn't raise your hand. I'm sorry, you're just doing a little stretch. What's another way we can show parents that we love them in our actions? What's something else? Is card games our best guess? Um, make stuff for them? Make stuff for them. That is a great way to show them that you love them, right? Make them a gift, something handmade. <laughs> Olivia. Give a cupcake, give them a treat, give them something nice, right? There's tons of things we can do, right? What's up? Make them a snowflake. 
Make them a snowflake, right? Very specific. Exactly. All right, hold on, Ian. You've already answered like so many times. You're, you're showing everyone up. <laughs> or give them a card. Exactly. There's so many things we can do, right? And we don't just have to give them stuff. We can make our beds without being asked, right? We can set the table, hugging them. We can pick up stuff. All of these are great things. One of the best things we can do, though, for our parents is listen to their instructions the first time and not talk back when they tell us to do something. This is a really important thing we can do. And Jesus kind of calls us to do this too, right? That's where it's always getting to a Jesus thing. Jesus also asks us to listen to his instructions, right? He says in our Bible story today, he says that if anyone loves me, they will obey my teachings, right? Have you guys heard the phrase, actions speak louder than words? You've heard that phrase? It's pretty popular. If you haven't heard it, I'm sure you will later. Action speaks louder than words, a really popular phrase, and that's kind of what Jesus is getting at today, right? Actions speak louder than words. Show people, right, that you love me. Don't just talk about it, right? Be about it. Another cliche that you will hear later in life. All right, I feel I'm losing you, but I think we got the gist of it today. And I hope dads feel better about this children's sermon than my Mother's Day sermon. All right, let us pray. Dear God, we have come to worship today to say I love you. Help us to leave this place and show that we love you through our actions. And we pray the Lord's Prayer with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, guys.
Let us pray. Lord God, let the words of your servant's mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and redeemer, through Christ. Amen. Our scripture reading today is from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. You can follow along on page 136 in your pew Bible. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all through them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesize as I had been commanded. And as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you are like me, you received a lesson in osteology from your church early in life. We learned, of course, that the foot bone is connected to the leg bone. The leg bone is connected to the knee bone. The knee bone is connected to the thigh bone. The thigh bone connected to the backbone. The backbone is, after all, connected to the neck bone. The neck bone connected to the head bone. Oh, hear the word of the Lord. Them bones, them bones, going to walk around. Oh, hear the word of the Lord. There is much debate about exactly when Ezekiel had his prophetic say. However, there can be little doubt that Ezekiel was a witness to the slow and unstoppable dismantling of his home and his race first in 597 and later a far more cataclysmic event in 587 and 586 when Nebuchadnezzar finally had had his fill of Judean defiance and reduced Jerusalem to a smoldering rubble. When Ezekiel famously conjures up dry bones, he knows of what he speaks. He has witnessed the death and the slaughter of so many of his people. The vision begins in a nightmare, an unnamed valley full of bones. The prophet soon learns after he is led around the vast number of bones by the spirit or wind or breath that these are very dry bones. Dry bones mean that they have been there a long time. And then the Spirit 
asks an astonishing question. Mortal, can these bones live? No, God, might be the expected answer, but Ezekiel is not ready to take that risk. So he answers Yahweh, God, you know. I suppose that it is always a safe response when God asks something of us, but Yahweh will have nothing of it have nothing of Ezekiel passing the buck, prophesy to the bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of Yahweh. God asks Ezekiel, can these bones live? God is challenging the prophet and all who have ever looked into the face of life and death, calling for response. Our bones are are dried up. Our hope is lost. We are completely cut off. That's what verse 11 tells us. So the real, the real congregation for Ezekiel's sermon is in fact the exiles of Israel who feel exactly like a heap of dry bones. But the promise of God, the promise of Yahweh is I will bring you back. I will bring you back to the land of Israel and you shall know that I am God. When I open your graves and bring you up from the grave, I will put my spirit, my breath, my wind within you and you shall live I will place you on your own soil so that you will know that I am Yahweh. I have spoken and I will act. Ezekiel's vision is given for those who have lost heart, who are suffering a death of the spirit, a living death, an exile in a foreign land. Their temple, the place that housed God, had been destroyed. Their holy city had been plundered. Ezekiel witnessed to the soul of his people. Gradually, he witnessed the souls of his people gradually wither and die, becoming as lifeless as the valley of the dry bones. Can these bones live? That is what God was asking. The vision is held up again today. And so many have had their experience of dry bones. Our earth has been fashioned into a massive graveyard of dry bones, forming valleys of death in a creation once proclaimed to be good. And we are not content with valleys of past evil, but continue to add to their number in new valleys heaped full of bones that are the suburbs of Kiev and Mariupol, the gun violence in our own city's streets, valleys everywhere there is no respect for human life. There is also the spiritual death, that poverty, natural disasters, tragedy and evil act on people to reduce them to a state of dry bones. This spiritual death is the cry to God in the depth of the dark night and its despair. Can these bones, can they live? Can these bones live again? Well, today we hear a promise only God can give. God tells the prophet to speak to these bones saying, Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. God promises not only sinews and flesh and skin, but most importantly, God calls the breath to come in from the four winds and breathe on us. This breath is the Spirit of God the life-giving ruach in the Hebrew, 
The same God breath that God breathed into the first human creatures in the garden. This ruach, this most ancient and holy breath, is the same breath active in Lazarus' story. The same breath breathed into Jesus crucified, lifting him up to resurrection life. And this same breath touched us as the Spirit came upon us in baptism. The breath moves through the world, raising people into new life when all the odds are stacked against them. We need to hear the vision of Ezekiel in the Valley of Dry Bones. It is a scene meant to live in the imagination and in the heart when we find ourselves gasping for breath, struggling to stay alive. Ezekiel promises that Yahweh still has a future for the chosen people. We are Ezekiel's dry bones, waiting for a fresh breath of the Spirit to give us new sinew and flesh and skin so that we might become whole again. Mortals, can these bones live? Yes, Lord, most definitely, yes. Thanks to your holy breath, breathing upon us as often as needed. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Please stand if you are comfortable doing so and join me in reading a portion of the Scots Confession. We confess and acknowledge on God alone, to whom alone we must cleave, who alone we must serve, whom only we must worship, and in whom alone we put our trust. God is eternal infinite, immeasurable, incomprehensible, omnipotent, invisible, one in substance and yet distinct in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, by whom we confess and believe all things in heaven and earth to have been created, to be retained in their being, and to be ruled and guided by his inscrutable providence for such end as his eternal wisdom goodness and justice have anointed, and to the manifestation of his own glory. Amen.
Please be seated. I'd like to first invi invite Rick Lippert to please come forward, if you will, sir. Do you mind coming right up here, please? Rick's now saying I should not have said yes. No. Friends, this is Rick Lippert. Uh, he is one of the Lippert Brothers, part of Lippert Brothers Construction. And Rick was our first responder. He was the one that took the phone call on March 31st in 2017 uh, when the windows were first damaged. So uh, he was there from the very first moments of that trying time uh, to help uh, shepherd us through. But Lippert Brothers' uh, history with this church goes back so much further than that. It was Rick's grandfather uh, who was in charge in the general contractor of the construction of First Presbyterian Church. Uh, he was uh, in charge of the construction of Wattorn Hall and the chapel, uh, the office and education buildings, and then sadly uh, passed away mid-construction of the sanctuary. Uh, so wasn't able to see this uh, project to its full completion, uh, but his family has certainly carried the torch. Uh, Lippert Brothers has been there uh, supporting our facility uh, since, really, since its groundbreaking. And so uh, at our time of need, they once again responded and masterfully uh, worked with all of the different moving parts uh, to get rock quarried in one state and then milled in Canada and glass going all over the place and coming into just a big old mess and look at what we have now. So I think for lack of more words, I will just say from the bottom of our hearts, thank you very much thank you. for all that you do for us. Thank you. Thank you. I would now like to ask Ron Grace and Jack Lancaster to come forward. And of course, it was our intention to have uh, Wayne Osman before you as well, uh, but Wayne is not able to be here today. Kind of amazed myself. Thank you, Jack, for being here. No. <laughs> Who stands before you are your peers. Uh, Jack Lancaster is our facilities manager, but also a member uh, of the congregation. And Ron Grace uh, is a, a longtime member. And both, in addition to Wayne Osmond, worked tirelessly uh, to shepherd us through the process of restoring these windows. Um, Ron and Wayne, uh, thanks to their um, 
wonderful gifts of stewardship were able to massage a, a two plus million dollar repair into a $10,000 insurance copay. So we thank you very much for helping allow uh, for the replacement and repair of these windows. Uh, and Jack, for your uh, tireless efforts in uh, just helping on the ground through from the moment of discovery uh, to all of the different uh, scaffoldings coming up and down and up and down and, and uh, glass and stone. We appreciate so much all the that uh, both of you have done uh, in service of your church. So uh, please accept our gratitude for helping us get to this day. Thank you. Thank you. You don't really know. <laughs> how lucky you are. I say that often to the congregation of First Presbyterian Church because a lot of you have always been here and I've been to other places. And uh, I have served churches that were a little bit stuck in their Calvinist uh, tradition and there's not a piece of stained glass to be found in the whole place because uh, that's just not right and that's distracting. And I say fooey on that. <laughs> Uh, I have always found uh, stained glass and Celtic crosses uh, to be special things because they each tell a story. When you look at a Celtic cross, the symbols on it are meant to tell a biblical story. When you look at stained glass windows, they each tell a story. It was a way to communicate the truth of the Bible to people before there was literacy. And we are blessed with incredible uh, stained glass in this facility, world-class stained glass, um, of a level to which this was the last project uh, that Willett Hauser did before they had to go out of business because they could no longer find the craftspeople needed to maintain the quality um, of the work that they had done. So uh, this sanctuary also stands as kind of a testimony to uh, their work. But the thing about the glass is not just the stories that they tell. Um, stained glass windows have a transcendent quality about them. When, in my mind, the breath of God in the form of sunlight washes through the windows and casts colors all over the stonework and the walls of the sanctuary. It's hard to see in the middle of the day, but I would invite you to come back one day in the late uh, afternoon um, because the windows through the colors tell a story on the walls of the church that change throughout the year as the location of the sun changes. Uh, so it is a great privilege and honor to be able to work here and to be able to come into this space whenever uh, I want to and see um, how God is is speaking um, through the colors in the sanctuary. So um, I hope that you too uh, can find a place of transcendence, um, a middle ground where you can meet God um, through the ministry and the beauty uh, of the windows that I pray we not take for granted. So as we uh, rededicate them to God's glory this day, let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this special place. We thank you for how the windows created here help lift our spirits beyond ourselves to somewhere a little bit closer to you. So we pray that you continue to speak to generations, your holy inspiration through the glory of these windows. It is in Christ's name that we now rededicate them. Amen.
The church has different ways to receive your pledges, tithes, and offerings. If you are worshiping with us in the sanctuary, offering plates are located by the doors as you exit the sanctuary. Please drop your offering in the plate. If you are worshiping with us from home today, you can support us through Venmo. Search for FPC OKC. You can also support us through the website. Click the Give button on the home page, or you can mail your contribution to the church. Thank you for your support of the ministry of First Presbyterian. Now let us return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth. Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let us worship God with our pledges, tithes, and offerings. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give our best, lest in gaining the world we lose life itself. As a covenant people, we seek to witness to your will and way. Help us to know more clearly what you would have us to do with the wealth entrusted to our care. As we contribute to the needs of your people, we present ourselves as living sacrifices. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. 
as did our ancestors in the faith before us, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. The Lord bless thee, the Lord keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen. Please join us in Watchhorn Hall. 